Section 36 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hawaii in August 2010. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 36 Marie Antoinette. Part 1 my hair is gray but not with years for it grew white in a single night as men's have grown from sudden fears byron the first french revolution like the superlative vices it both sprang from and gave birth to was a monster of frightful mien but it cannot be said of it as of vice that seen too oft familiar with its face we first endure then pity then embrace the revolting theme as one congenial to any sympathies of our nature there is such a thing as human nature and such a thing as french nature said a great writer and nothing but a french temperament that still delights in blue fire and bloody bone fiction can often relish such a dish of horrors as the reign of terror at least it must be a jaded parisian sensualism that needs such an incentive to mental appetite the craving for the horrible that like the inclination to fix a fascinated gaze on the face of the dead or to approach and leap from a precipice is a strange attribute of mind finds this portion of earth's history too nauseating to be many times perused the ingredients collected by the witches of Macbeth for a charm of powerful trouble, of which the most palatable were Edda's fork and blind warm sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing, are mere child's confectionery in the comparison. The tortures of the Hindu and of the American savage are tender mercies when contrasted with the red fool fury of the Seine. And besides the disgusting and stupefying nature of the details, they are too familiar to everyone in this reading age to make a repicturing of them pardonable. No subject has been so often rehearsed, and it is necessarily and sufficiently brought into view in the accounts of other heroines of the period, so that the events accompanying Marie Antoinette's agonies may be now dismissed with a glance. Into her cup, all the blackest drops of those dreadful years seem to have been pressed. So protracted, intense, and every way sharpened were her sufferings, and so indescribable was the monster revolution that slowly crushed her in its coils, that no language can represent the reality, except it be Pollock's unequalled painting of the undying worm, a passage of poetry well worth examining in this connection one i remarked attentively but how shall i describe what naught resembles else my eyes hath seen of worm or serpent kind it something looked but monstrous with a thousand snaky heads eyed each with double oars of glaring wrath and with as many tails that twisted out in horrid revolution tipped with stings and all its mouths that wide and darkly gaped and breathed most poisonous breath had each a sting forked and long and venomous and sharp and in its writhings infinite it grasped malignantly what seemed a heart swollen vast and quivering with torture most intense and still the heart with anguish throbbing high made effort to escape but could not for however it turned and oft it vainly turned these complicated foldings held it fast, and still the monstrous beast with sting of head or tail transpierced it, bleeding evermore. Such was Marie Antoinette's high-throbbing heart, and such was the mob of Paris, an unimaginable dragon headed by mad tribunals. No connected sketch of the life of this unfortunate queen is intended, a few scenes in that life of wonderful vicissitudes will be given. 
The influences that surrounded her early years may be gathered from the biography of Maria Theresa, her imperial mother, who gave birth to this daughter in the palace at Vienna, November 2nd, 1755. The day was also memorable for the great earthquake at Lisbon, which, like the terrible thunderstorm that followed Marie Antoinette's marriage, was regarded by her as an evil omen, and certainly was a fit emblem of the earthquake and storm of political revolution which buried the splendors and joys of her reign in ruin, misery, and death. Fair-haired, beautiful, and joyous, Marie grew up in the peace and freedom of her early home. She was surrounded by brothers and sisters of remarkable loveliness and promise, who were enough company for her in all the occupations or sports of childhood and youth. The imperial nursery was their kingdom, where they ruled even their governesses and preceptors, and were safe from all intrusion. Their handsome and gay father, the Emperor Francis of Austria, visited them only to mingle in their gaieties, and received their noisy familiar caresses. Him they loved, and deeply mourned his death, as of one who was numbered in their happy band. He died when Marie, his favorite daughter, was ten years old, and before he set out on the journey from which he never returned alive, he ordered his coachman to wait until she was called, and he had again embraced her affectionately. The young princes and princesses regarded their masculine and heroic mother with little feeling except that of distant awe. She was too much occupied with her wars and affairs of state to think much of her family. But once a week did she visit them, with much the same business spirit that she reviewed her troops or inspected her public asylums. In the same way that one glances at a morning paper, or that she inquired the foreign news of her minister, she questioned her family physician each morning in regard to the health of her children, and she only deigned to see them when a sickness was reported, or when she occasionally gathered them at her dinner table, in order to impress some ambassador with the idea that she herself superintended their education. The teachers of Marie Antoinette were more solicitous to win her favor, from interested motives, than to advance her in knowledge. As feigned proofs of her proficiency, they exhibited to the Empress the exercises in composition which they had first written in pencil for Marie to trace afterwards in ink, or sketches of drawing which she had never touched with her own hand, and they taught her Latin sentences which she did not understand, but calmly recited to visitors at court on occasions of presentation, as if she were able to converse in that language. Metastasio, her Italian instructor, was alone faithful to his charge. He was so agreeable and assiduous that she could speak and write the soft musical language of Dante and Tasso with fluent elegance. She at length gained much facility in French conversation, but through all her life she was forced to lament her deficiency in every solid acquirement. After her engagement to the Dauphin of France, two French actors of superficial character were employed to perfect her in elocution and singing, and when these were dismissed as incompetent, the Abbé de Vermont was sent from Paris to be her tutor. He seems to have accomplished little else than the encouraging of her naturally unrestrained, frolicsome, and capricious disposition, and the instilling into her mind a lasting and fun-loving contempt of the ceremonious French court to which she was destined. After her arrival there, no effort of hers was sufficient to subdue her uncontrollable vivacity. The teachings of the Abbé, and the fashionable freedom of manners she had learned at Vienna, nor could she then find time or patience, notwithstanding her earnest attempts, to master the elements of history, philosophy, the English language, or even her native German, whereof she knew little, the Italian being the court speech of the Austrian capital. But what was lost in preparation for after life was gained in the careless and unchecked happiness of youth, which was almost the only unclouded sunshine of a life that gradually darkened to the deepest horrors. Unconscious of their subsequent splendid or wretched fate, 
she and her brothers and sisters pouted their full austrian lips in mock vexation or tossed their golden ringlets in mimic bravery laughed chattered and romped at their will through the apartments that were their little realm or sported among the trees fountains and lakes of the gardens of schönbrunn fifteen years of life bloomed in the cheek and sparkled in the eyes of marie when she bade a formal adieu to her dignified mother and a sad farewell to her comrades and youthful scenes her grief was relieved only by anticipations of the magnificence that awaited her as bride to the heir apparent of the french throne at the borders of her adopted land an embassy awaited to receive her and to conduct her to the bridegroom who was to meet her at compiegne quote, a superb pavilion unquote, writes madame campan quote, had been prepared upon the frontiers near Kell. it consisted of a vast saloon connected with two apartments one of which was assigned to the lords and ladies of the court of vienna and the other to the suite of the dauphiness composed of the countess de noailles her lady of honor the duchess de cosse her tirewoman four ladies of the bedchamber the count de saul taverne the first gentleman usher the count de tessé first equerry the bishop of chartres chief almoner the officers of the bodyguards and the pages when the dauphiness had been entirely undressed even to her body linen and stockings in order that she might retain nothing belonging to a foreign court an etiquette always observed on such an occasion the doors were opened the young princess came forward looking round for the countess de noailles then rushing into her arms she implored her with tears in her eyes and with a heartfelt sincerity to direct her to advise her and to be in every respect her guide and support it was impossible to refrain from admiring her aerial deportment her smile was sufficient to win the heart and in this enchanting being in whom the splendor of french gaiety shone forth an indescribable but august serenity perhaps also the somewhat proud position of her head and shoulders betrayed the daughter of the caesars End quote. passing thus through the central pavilion to the smaller tent occupied by her new friends she was arrayed in the costliest robes that france could command with a dazzling escort of nobility and soldiery with music and the ringing of village bells with illuminations by night and processions of flower strewing maidens by day the bride was hastened to the presence of the royal court which had come to compiegne to meet her and to accompany her to versailles there the wedding took place on the 16th of May, 1770. The utmost ingenuity of the most luxurious people in their most luxurious age was exhausted in the pomp and pleasures of the occasion. The beauty and deportment of Marie Antoinette added greatly to the enthusiasm of the scene. An eyewitness declares that, quote, the Dauphiness, then 15 years of age, beaming with freshness, appeared to all eyes more than beautiful. Her walk partook at once of the noble character of the princesses of her house and of the graces of the French. Her eyes were mild, her smile lovely. Louis the Fifteenth, the reigning monarch, was enchanted with the young Dauphiness. All his conversation was about her graces, her vivacity, and the aptness of her repartees she was yet more successful with the royal family when they beheld her shorn of the splendor of the diamonds with which she had been adorned during the earliest days of her marriage when clothed in a light dress of taffety she was compared to the venus di medicis and the atalanta of the marley gardens poets sang her charms painters attempted to copy her features an ingenious idea of one of the latter was rewarded by louis the fifteenth the painter's fancy led him to place the portrait of Marie Antoinette in the heart of a full-blown rose. End quote. She was not indeed regular in feature, but had enough loveliness to justify such superlative praise from her contemporaries. Her figure was tall and graceful, 
her movements had the ease and majesty of her mother when she excited the hungarians to arms her neck was proud and swan-like her hair a light auburn soft and lustrous her forehead high with finely arched brows and these with eyes of luminous blue full-blown lips and good teeth not to mention the brilliant expression which is the true charm of a countenance more than compensated for such defects as too prominent a nose and cheekbones her lively wit and impulsiveness was her crowning attraction though it occasioned her much trouble through the misrepresentation of enemies and her unavoidable infringements of uncongenial etiquette her husband was her opposite in everything but kindness and sincerity he was grandson to louis the fifteenth the voluptuous king who then held an oppressive sceptre plain in person he was awkward diffident coldly unimpassioned in temperament and devoted to retirement and books though afterwards a loving husband and tender father he was at first and for years totally insensible to the glowing charms of his wife never showing her a single mark of special affection nor acting towards her in any respect as a husband she bore this treatment with outward composure but inward grief and indignation it was this unaccountable absence of love on his part and her despair at the odium that would fall upon her if she never gave an heir to the crown that led her uneducated as she was to a frivolous life of amusement and extravagance which was greatly exaggerated by the scandalous reports of her foes and it was all this together with a national hatred towards austria fomented by factions of the nobility that led to the wreaking of popular vengeance on an innocent king and queen for the wrongs of centuries eight years of nominally married life passed before marie antoinette became a mother and gave herself to serious cares during this long period she was equally forced and disposed to banish her private misery by every expedient of recreation four years after her marriage her husband and herself had succeeded to the throne he being twenty-four years of age and she twenty when the news of the death of louis the fifteenth was brought to them they were overwhelmed with the sudden responsibility that had fallen on them and kneeling cried o oh god guide us protect us we are too young to govern but marie now a queen had still no resource but in the dissipations of royalty for her the palace of saint cloud was provided at an expense of a million dollars and a yearly income of eighty thousand dollars was appropriated to her use she had every temptation to live a butterfly life amidst all the sweets that were profusely offered to her taste and although she established several hospitals and made some provision for the poor in the vicinity of the gorgeous palace and grounds at versailles yet she yielded to the enticements of fashionable folly willing thus to drown her threefold mortification at her ignorance the indifference of the king and the calumnies of her adversaries her mind was natively vigorous and gifted but was suffered to run to waste besides saint cloud a small palace called the little trianon within the bounds of versailles was given to her it was of roman architecture exquisitely fitted up and situated among sequestered gardens in the adornment of which all the strange genius of the times had been displayed hither marie often fled from the balls operas festivities and tedious punctilio of the court to enjoy intervals of quiet and liberty arrayed in a loose white robe and straw hat and with a switch in her hand she tripped lightly over the fresh greensward and among a little band of friends acted the amateur farmer's wife or dairymaid the exterior of a thatched building was made to represent a barn while the interior was a brilliant ballroom for select private parties the fashions at this period manifested the spirit of the land and the age in which marie's fortune was cast
at the commencement of her reign the hair full of powder and pomatum was erected to a height that almost doubled the apparent stature of the ladies caricatures were published representing hairdressers as ascending to these towers of hair by means of ladders hooped dresses were worn distended like balloons but the story of paul and virginia in which the simple dress of the heroine is described so captivated all hearts that a great revolution in dress was effected plain robes of white muslin and straw hats succeeded afterwards as the revolution advanced the grecian and roman costumes were exactly copied in honor of the ancient republics this however was after the queen's imprisonment when she was reduced to the one dress which she happened to wear at the time of her capture as an instance of the fetes given by the queen and the manner in which every deed of hers was misrepresented may be quoted a description of a scene at the petit trianon on the occasion of a visit from her brother the emperor joseph of austria Quote, the arch with which the english garden was lighted not illuminated produced a charming effect earth and lamps concealed by painted green boards threw a light upon the beds of shrubs and flowers and brought out their several tints in the most varied and pleasing manner several hundred burning faggots in the moat behind the temple of love kept up a blaze of light which rendered the spot the most brilliant in the garden after all the evening's entertainment was indebted to the good taste of the artists yet it was much talked of the uninvited courtiers were dissatisfied and the people who never forgive any fetes but those they share in contributed greatly to the envious exaggerations which were circulated as to the cost of this little affair which was so ludicrously absurd as to state that the faggots burnt in the moat required the destruction of a whole forest the queen being informed of these reports was determined to know exactly how much wood had been consumed and she found that fifteen hundred faggots had sufficed to keep up the fire until four o'clock in the morning End quote. but neither in this case nor in any other did any contradiction of ill-natured stories serve to disabuse the public mind the king took no part in the diversions of his consort and this gave color to the gross charges circulated against her he was a man of good features yet with a melancholy look his walk was a plodding one his hair and dress disorderly however neatly arranged by his attendants and his voice was harsh and shrill marie would gladly have nestled herself in his affection had he proffered it notwithstanding his ungainly appearance and stolid manners he gave himself much to study was versed in history and english literature familiar with geography and fond of drawing and coloring maps he had also an unaristocratic liking for mechanic arts such as masonry and lock-making and would employ himself with a locksmith in his private room from which he would often come into the queen's presence with his hands blackened with his work but he was a man of upright and benevolent intentions and regular habits whether the queen were to attend a party or concert or not he always retired to sleep at precisely ten o'clock in all church observances he was very conscientious as also in his endeavors to reform abuses of government and after a few years he gradually warmed towards his wife so that he became at length an exemplary tender husband and father he was worthy of a better fate than that which awaited him end of section thirty six thirty seven of the heroines of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by avai in august two thousand and ten the heroines of history by john s jenkins section thirty seven marie antoinette part two 
such were the king and queen of france on whom fell the iniquities of a long line of sovereigns they became the parents of four children two of whom died in infancy leaving maria theresa and louis charles two bright and beautiful children the first of whom was eleven years old and the last eight when the tempest of the revolution burst upon the royal family this event was chiefly due to ages of wrong to the influence of the american revolution and to the plotting factions of french nobles and statesmen who inflamed the populace and brought destruction on themselves as well as their good king but there were many incidents in the queen's life which perverted by busy scandal hastened the fearful denouement the chief of these was the famous affair of the diamond necklace marie was fond of jewelry louis XV had given her a necklace of pearls each of which was as large as a filbert and all remarkably alike and the crown jewels she used of course she had also bracelets that cost forty thousand dollars bachma the crown jeweler had gratified her with earrings composed of pear-shaped diamonds and worth seventy thousand dollars he now determined to outdo himself he traveled over europe bought up the rarest diamonds and made a necklace in which he expended a fortune of three hundred and twenty thousand dollars this he offered to the queen but to his astonishment her taste had become more simple and her sense of economy was too strong for the temptation by no means could he induce her to purchase his chef d'oeuvre in which all his hopes were at stake meanwhile the countess lamotte a relative yet enemy of the royal family and a dissolute woman forged a promissory note in the queen's name for the amount of the necklace and palmed off the deception on cardinal de rohan who thus procured the jewels for the countess she disposed of them in some way and began to live in a style of great extravagance the sovereigns believed the cardinal to be an accomplice in the fraud he and the countess were tried he was acquitted and doubtless to show an indignity to her royal blood she was sentenced by the tribunal to be whipped branded and imprisoned for life afterwards she perished tragically in london but it was industriously reported that the queen was privy to the whole plot against the jeweller and the dark suspicion exasperated many against marie antoinette besides this from her first entrance into france innumerable tales were spread to her prejudice from the hour of her marriage madame du barry the transcendently fascinating courtesan of louis the fifteenth jealous of the influence of the fair young austrian did all in her power to injure her the old formal dowagers in their hoop dresses and black caps who waited on the dauphiness were shocked at her youthful improprieties and became her implacable enemies their spite being specially increased by the irrepressible smiles of marie when on state occasions her friend a roguish young marchioness made sport of the solemn ladies by playing pranks behind their backs the austrian's girlish mirthfulness and nonconformity to the absurd etiquette of the court was improved to the utmost by all lovers of form or haters of austrian supremacy after she assumed the crown she abolished the custom of admitting the people to see the royal family dine a moving crowd having always been permitted to enter the palace and gaze at their sovereigns at table from behind the railing as if it were a show of feeding wild animals the denial of this privilege was a grudge against the queen her want of education likewise exposed her to the animadversions of the intellectual society of paris and this was heightened by her natural choice of not the best informed ladies for her favorites her villa of little trianon was falsely said to have been named by her little vienna while it was reported that she hated france and sighed for her native land she once brought home a peasant child who had been run over by her carriage this child was actually declared to be an illegitimate son of her own whom she had introduced into the palace by such an expedient.
At another time, her royal chariot broke down on the way to the opera, obliging her to take a hackney coach. This was maliciously construed into an apology for some nightly assignation. So also, at a levee, she expressed admiration for a heron's plume, worn by the unprincipled Duke de Lausune. He gallantly presented it to her, and she, not to offend him, once appeared with it in public, enough to feed the greedy appetite of impure rumor for a long while. At the gardens of Marly, with a company of ladies and gentlemen, she took a ride at night to the hills to see the sunrise, and this adventure was pronounced a covered plan of licentiousness. After an unusual fall of snow, she got up a sleigh ride in the streets of Paris with rich equipage to the surprise of all the people, who accused her of a design to introduce Austrian customs. In private theatricals she performed as an actress, and in private parties she gleefully engaged in such simple sports as blind man's buff, to the general indignation of all sticklers for dignity. In short, there was no end of the stories set afloat by cunning persons, and every incident was converted into caricature, a defamatory picture, or a song to be sung by the street beggars. She was even insulted often to her face when she imprudently assumed a mask and mingled with promenaders on the avenues. After a reign of nineteen years, the slowly gathering storm that long had darkened over the heads of Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette broke in the thundering tread, the lightning violence and torrent rush of the mobs of 1789 tattered haggard and drunken crowds emerging from the dens of paris raged through the streets armed with pikes clubs and every instrument that could be converted into a weapon of attack the king insisted on gentle measures and when his troops were driven from the city he collected his army around him at versailles the capital was abandoned to the infuriated people who leveled the Bastille to the ground, and sacked every house they chose to invade. It is in vain to follow the course of events, and attempt to give the scenes of the revolution in detail. The eye need be fastened now upon the Queen alone, in all the awful trials through which she passed to the scaffold. A few brief paragraphs only are required to set forth her heroic portrait on the dark and confused background of that reign of terror. From the first, the determination of her mother was kindled within her. She vainly urged the king to take decided steps to force down the rebellion. When he was absent on his dangerous and fruitless visit to the National Assembly at Paris, she prepared to follow him to the last extremity. On his return, at a banquet of the military officers, she, together with him, excited as wild enthusiasm as did her mother among the Hungarians at Pressburg. And when the monster mob rushed from the city, dragged its mighty bulk along the road to Versailles, to coil its slimy and bristling convolutions around the palace itself, and shake its thousands of hissing tongues in the very sanctuary of royalty, she, urged to fly with her children, would not desert her lord, but said, Quote, nothing shall induce me in such an extremity to be separated from my husband i know that they seek my life but i am the daughter of maria theresa and i have not learned to fear death End quote. it was the evening of a dismal rainy day when the delirious and countless multitude reached versailles to hold its hideous orgies all night in the gardens and cottages Assured of protection by Lafayette, commander of the guard, the queen, when it was nearly daylight the next day, endeavored to get an hour's repose. But she had hardly closed her eyes before the swarming ruffians broke into the palace and thundered at the door of her chamber. She had barely escaped to the apartments of the king when they shivered the door of her own and plunged their pikes and knives into her empty bed. The next day her courage rose to sublimity. Beholding her trusty soldiers butchered in the courtyard of the palace, she undoubtedly presented herself at the windows, while bullets were flying around her, 
and she refused the protection of a friend who threw himself before her. She declared that the king could not afford to lose so faithful a subject as he. The crowd called for her to show herself in the balcony. She came forward with her children, thinking to move their sympathy. They at once roared forth the cry, Away with the children! Without an instant's hesitation or a change of color in her face, she sent away the children and stood alone in the balcony, lifting her eyes to God, with clasped hands and resigned to fall the next moment as a ransom for her family. A dead silence struck the mad concourse. They were overwhelmed at her sublime self-sacrifice, and suddenly from every throat went up the shout, Live the Queen! Live the Queen! With a purposeless frenzy, the poor, misguided, famished, and intoxicated mob demanded that the king should return with them to the city. The queen would not be parted from him, and beyond all description was the ride of theirs to Paris, borne along as they were for seven hours by a flood of desperate creatures who loaded them with abuse, endangered their lives by frequent shots, and shocked them by the bloody heads of the slaughtered guard, carried on pikes, and thrust before the windows of their carriage. Thirty thousand madmen, armed with every possible weapon, surrounded the cortege, and women, crazed with poverty, crime, and rum, were seated on the cannon that were rolled along, and sang ribald songs in ridicule of the queen. The feelings of a mother were too strong in her for any dismay on her own account, she held her boy on her knee and tried to soothe his terrors. For two years the sovereigns were little more than prisoners in the palaces of the Tuileries and St. Cloud. The National Guard surrounded them, day and night, ostensibly to protect, but really to hold them captive, and constantly were they threatened with assassination. Marie Antoinette in vain entreated her husband to use active measures to assert his authority, or else to fly to the frontiers. He possessed a calm and indomitable courage in endurance, but had none for action, and he believed that repeated concessions to the demands of the people would at last satisfy them. And so she devoted herself to the instruction of her children, or employed herself with embroidery, maintaining a serene and cheerful fortitude during all those months of alarm. Many plans for their secret escape were formed by their friends. These plots were either divulged and the instigators beheaded, or, if nearly successful, were defeated by the inaction of Louis. At length the case became too desperate for even his passive nature. He and his wife were falsely accused of exciting the rally of the Allied powers, who were now collecting an army that threatened to march upon Paris and suppress the revolution with fire and sword. The royal family were openly denounced in the National Assembly as traitors to their country. The scheme of flight was matured after long and anxious deliberation. The royal family retired as usual on the night of the 20th of June, 1791, at 11 o'clock. No sooner were they in their rooms than they disguised themselves, and departing by the rear doors of the palace and taking separate routes through the obscurest streets of Paris, they sought the rendezvous appointed for them to take the coaches prepared. The queen, leading her daughter and accompanied by one of her bodyguard, arrived soon at the place agreed upon, but had to wait a long time in extreme anxiety for the king, who had lost his way. In silent and agonizing apprehension they met, entered their carriages, and were rapidly driven with relays of horses, all that night and the next day, to Varennes, 180 miles from Paris. Before reaching that town they had been recognized and the news of their approach sent in advance. The circumstances cannot be rehearsed. A crowd collected. The king declared himself and appealed to the people, but vainly. They had arrived there in the evening. All night the queen remained in the mayor's house. It was the night of her intensest agony, and in the morning her hair, which before was a beautiful brown, 
was found to have turned white in consequence of her indescribable misery. The return to Paris, the next day and night after their arrest, was a repetition of the terrible journey to Versailles, only now it was eighteen times the distance, and their distress was heightened by utter exhaustion and hopelessness. Riotous crowds thronged the road, cursing and jeering the captives, or attempting to fall upon them like greedy wolves, and old men who ventured a look or gesture of respect towards their king were massacred before his eyes, without mercy. Amidst suffocating multitudes, dust and heat, and fainting with thirst and terror at more daring menaces, they entered the city. As the doors of the palace closed upon them, a universal cry of rage rent the air and was prolonged to their ears like reverberating thunder. Guards kept their eyes upon the queen every moment, day and night, to the outrage of her modesty and to the disgrace of humanity. The king for days was struck dumb with despair, and at last Marie cast herself with her children before him, saying, quote, We may all perish, but let us at least perish like sovereigns, and not wait to be strangled unresistingly upon the very floor of our apartments. End quote. And Madame Elizabeth, sister of the king, the other heroine of these scenes, and the most saintly woman, assisted in cheering the unfortunate monarch. And bravely did he arouse himself and face the brutal mob that broke into the palace prison the next day to revenge themselves for his refusal to authorize a persecution of the priest. They came with banners, one of which was a doll hung up by the neck, and beneath it the words, To the gibbet with the Austrian! They wrenched down the doors and rioted through the splendid apartments, destroying everything in their way, and pressed upon the king and queen, who were only saved by maintaining extraordinary composure and uttering some popular expressions. Some sentiment of the sacredness of royal persons seemed to have remained, and held back the frantic concourse like a magic spell. For hours the family were exposed to the rush and gaze of the populace, until the president of the assembly succeeded in dispersing them. Further attempts to poison or assassinate the queen were made, and many insults endured by her. It is in vain to enumerate them. It is adding the same colors to the terrific picture. The mob, in August 1792, demanded that the king should be dethroned, and again attacked the Tuileries, at which they pointed their loaded cannon. An officer urged the family to take refuge in the National Assembly. Marie resisted the proposal, and seizing the officer's pistol, placed them in the hands of Louis and said, quote, Now, sire, is the time to show yourself, and if we must perish, let us perish with glory. End quote. But, subdued at the sight of her children, she consented to go. Fearful was their passage through the bloodthirsty crowd, while their friends were butchered, and long were the hours of suspense as they sat in a box behind the seat of the president of the assembly. But they never trembled nor quailed. The queen gazed steadfastly and indignantly, like the very statue of outraged majesty, at the excited assembly. The king was dethroned, and, with his family, was imprisoned in the monastery of the Feuillants. Afterwards, they were incarcerated in a gloomy fortress called the Temple. The reign of terror was at its height, and nothing but the strength of their dungeon saved them from the foaming desire of the city to add their royal blood to the streams of human gore that deluged the streets. Months passed, their few comforts were gradually withdrawn, one by one they were separated, the king was executed, her son was taken from the queen, and so abused in his confinement that he afterwards became insane and died, and on the 14th of October 1793, four months after her husband's death, Marie Antoinette fell a victim to the busy and dread guillotine. When they tore her son from her, she resisted the cruelty with furious desperation. 
and when they took her from her daughter, she accidentally struck her own forehead against the door, and to the question whether she was hurt, she said with the preternatural calmness of an utterly broken heart, quote, Oh no, nothing now can further hurt me. End quote. In the damp, dark, loathsome underground dungeon of the Conciergerie, the place of the doomed, the daughter of Maria Theresa, the admired and gay queen of St. Cloud and Versailles, awaited her fate. She had stood up before the vociferous and exulting spectators at the tribunal, and heard her sentence without the quivering of a nerve, and without stooping to offer a word of defense, though the most groundless charges were uttered against her. And now she knelt in her cell, prayed, and then slept as tranquilly as if she were reposing on the satin damask of her petit trianon, after a stroll among flowers and fountains. Two hours of slumber passed. She was awakened, and dressed in the only fine garments that she had preserved amidst her soiled array. She wore a white loose robe, pure as her innocence, with a cap and black ribbon on her head. The day was cold and misty. At eleven o'clock her hands were bound. She was placed in a rough cart, and jolted along through the crowd that cried, Down with the Austrian! One glance at that scene of her pleasures and woes, the Tuileries, and she ascended the scaffold, knelt, and said, quote, Lord, enlighten and soften the hearts of my executioners. Adieu forever, my children. I go to join your father. End quote. Her children, in their distant dungeons, heard not the words, but we may trust that they were heard in heaven. The glittering yet blood-stained blade fell, the executioner lifted her head by the prematurely white hair, and the air echoed to the cry, Vive la République! In her grave, where now stands the church of the Madeleine, were buried thirty-eight years of as joyous youth, splendid pleasures, and awful tortures as ever fell to the lot of a mortal. Hers was a wild, beautiful, and noble nature, gentle, yet tameless, ensnared from first to last in an unparalleled series of events, and slowly tortured to life's close by miseries which a superhuman ingenuity could not have more terribly devised than did her enemies. End of section 37